Did you know that the way your brain perceives speed depends on your priors? It's not the same at night, and it's not the same for everybody. This is another of these episodes I love, where we dive into neuroscience, how the brain works, and how it relates to patient stats. It's actually a follow-up to episode 77, where Pascal Wallisch told us how the famous black and blue dress tells a lot about our priors, about how we perceive the world. So I strongly recommend listening to episode 77 first. It's in the show notes for this one, if you're really, really lazy and don't want to go to the website. And then come back here, listen to this episode, and have your mind blown away again, this time by Alan Stocker, our guest for this episode. Alan was born and raised in Switzerland after a PhD in physics at the ETH Zurich. He somehow found himself doing neuroscience during a postdoc at New York University. And then he never stopped. He's still leading the computational perception and cognition laboratory of the University of Pennsylvania to this day. But Alan is not only a man of stats. He's also a man of music, playing the piano when he can, a man of coffee. He'll never say no to an Olympia Cremina or a cafe tech. And a man of the outdoors. He loves trashing through deep powder with his snowboard. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 81, recorded March 17, 2023. <music> Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, for any info about the podcast, learnbaysestats.com is la place to be. Show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbaysestats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.andora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbaystats.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes wide and maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like I'm Richard Feynman. Alan Stoker, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Yeah, welcome for having me. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you bet. I, I want to thank Pascal Wallisch for uh, putting us <laughs> in contact. I recorded a very interesting episode with him a few weeks ago, talking about the famous bicolor dress. So I'll put that episode in the show notes, of course, episode 77, if I remember correctly. And yeah, of course, we got to talk about Bayesian priors. I mean, about priors. And then Pascal suggested that I talk to you because it's also something you work a lot on. So we're going to come to that. But first, this will be the, the main dish. But first, we need to, to start with your background or your origin story, as I like to say. So, <laughs> Alan, how did you come to the world of neuroscience and psychology? And... Was it a sinuous or a straight path? How much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my path was pretty um, non-direct. Actually, I grew up in Switzerland. I went to ETH in Zurich, studied uh, mechanical engineering, actually. So my original dream was to become an engineer, in particular an, an engineer of Formula One race cars. That was kind of my dream. <laughs> oh. And, uh, you know, I always liked... I like cars, I like technology, and for me, that seemed to be kind of the pinnacle of, you know, car engineering. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I, I looked into some kind of options, and uh, the market is pretty small, 
it was hard to get an internship. And so at some point I gave up on that. And then I think, I mean, I always cared about how we think, just thinking in general, logic. I like playing games, you know, uh, doing riddles. And I think it was really more like accidentally that I came to neuroscience in the sense that I did a, a... an exchange year, not an exchange year, an exchange semester. Mm -hmm. And I think the only options there were, because I'm usually I'm very short, I don't like to plan much ahead. So it was my last year, my last year in undergrad. I wanted to do an exchange uh, semester and I went to that exchange office and they said, look, here are two options. You can go to Finland. (laughs) And uh, I think I forgot the other option. But so I said, oh, Finland, that sounds cool. So I went to Finland and there I did some project over the summer in Finland over the summer doing any kind of research is kind of crazy because nobody works. But anyway, I, I did it and uh, the project was about using neural networks to actually analyze some brain scan images of people with tumors and stuff like that. And this was in the, you have to remember, this was in the 90s, late 90s of last century. And the artificial neural networks were kind of the first version, right? The, the shallow version that was that was kind of the heyday. Got some hop field networks and all kinds of networks. And so I was working with those networks, uh, trying to do this classification. So we had this brain scan, F- MRI images. And uh, we tried to figure out what is my matter and gray matter and tumor and stuff like that. And so through, the, through that, I came into kind of the contact of the brain in, so, in some ways. <laughs> and, you know, neural networks as a kind of a means of these days, I would say intelligent you know, processing. And so that gave me then a way towards my PhD direction which has still nothing really directly to do with base and behavior and <laughs> what I'm doing right now, but uh, at least it was going towards that, that direction. So during my PhD, then I built actually neural networks in h- hardware, physical hardware. We built integrated circuits that did some kind of neural computation. And um, I spent a lot of time in the engineering problem, how we design the circuits, really semiconductor physics, you know, you have to deal with noise and all kinds of things that took most of the time. And actually the neural computation part was kind of the interesting part. <laughs> I, I can only spend little time on it. And so I decided to do a postdoc, postdoc studies after my PhD. Oh, that's when you went to the US. Okay. Yeah. That's when I went oh, to the US. Oh, and you met Pascal at that time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was at that time. And I, I joined a lab, a lab by Eros Amicelli, who, who did some early work about Bayesian inference and Bayes as a kind of a model of how, for example, the visual motion perception system would actually resolve some kind of the ambiguity in, in, the, in the image uh, domain when you translate that to some kind of motion domain. And uh, yeah, so that was kind of kind of my path. And so then there I started building these Bayesian models, which we're going to probably talk a little more. And um, since then I have been in that field. <laughs> no more Formula One car design. <laughs> but that's so cool. Yeah. I think you're like one of the, fir- like, you're the first person definitely to tell me that like, yeah, their dream was to become mechanical engineer for Formula One racing. It's like extremely precise. I'm impressed. That's so cool. Yeah. I would have liked to have that you know, very precise dream. But so I, I'm guessing you still watch a lot of Formula One and like, have you watched the Netflix series? I did not because, you know, I don't trust. No, it's, it's you know, it's the modern Formula One is so, uh, it's like everything modern. It's just the fun is taking out of it. So I don't really care about that anymore. But I still, I still follow the t- technology. Mm-hmm. I think it's still fascinating. Um, it's kind of this. It's the same thing that's fascinating about Bayes. In some ways, it's it's you know, there's some really brilliant minds trying to optimize something. In this case, a car to go as fast as possible, right? Given some constraints, they're given by the rules, right? And um, yeah, it's just human 
or the ingenuity of the minds in work is kind of fascinating. Yeah, it's a really fun game to play, again, guess. Because also it's a lot of <laughs> physics, yeah. but then you have the constraints of the game, which like that, that definitely that's fascinating to me. And also it's like kind of an endless of an endless endeavor, right? You can always make it a bit better on that front on that or that other front. There must be trade-offs or things like that. So like you can never have the perfect car, I guess, at least in an absolute term. Something I would like to do is actually drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the modern simulators or the games, right? Uh, video games are pretty, uh, I mean, they're not, they're pretty good in kind of simulating the physics and uh, you get, a, you get a sense of you know, how tricky these cars are to drive and things like that. Oh yeah, for sure. But that must be something else to really be in the car, like, you know, get the sensations, like get the, like the adrenaline, that's something entirely different. Yeah. So if any, if any listeners are into, uh, into the formula one, world, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> so thanks a lot for digging a bit into your past like that. Uh, I love how sinuous that was reminds me of mine, I guess. And, um, so actually, yeah. Can you define the work you're doing nowadays and what are the topics that you're particularly interested in? Okay. Wow. Well, that's a, another big question. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, as an academic, you, of course you have certain directions that you go, but I'm pretty open to a lot of, of different questions. Uh, you know, if you're curious mind, then there are a lot of curious questions out there, right? Clearly it's about at the moment, it's still about the human mind. We want to understand ultimately how, how humans operate, how the human mind works, what is human intelligence, but also subconsciously, right? How the other cortical processes that we, or neural processes in general that we are not aware of how they operate. And so since my postdoc years, yeah, since I started kind of looking into these Bayesian models, I think the general approach is still the same in the sense that I assume that the brain or the mind operates as good as it can, okay, given some constraints. That means if the, if the brain makes a mistake or, you know, shows something that is not ideal, then it's not because it doesn't try to do it or it doesn't try to solve the problem as good as possible. It's simply that it cannot or it has to make trade-offs, right, that allow the brain not to operate at, at some maximal expectation. And I think this is still something that, for example, the economist, since you're working in the bank, <laughs> have trouble with understanding, right? This seemingly irrational behavior of people when they do economic decisions. And I don't think in, in the large scale, it's, it's really something that they, they just don't care. <laughs> They're obviously, it's about money. They probably want to do as good as possible, but it's always a question of what's the information they have and what are additional constraints that actually prevent them to find a rational, optimal decision. Right? And that's similar for the questions we address, which is not in the economic world, but more kind of in the cognitive world. How do people solve cognitive problems? How do they make decisions? How do they perceive the world? Because perceiving is a very difficult inference problem. You get a lot of sensory information here, and the brain has to make sense of it. And um, again, it's very sensible to think the brain tries to get as good an answer about what's out there in the world as possible. It doesn't like to make mistakes. And so when it makes mistakes, they're kind of honest mistakes in the sense that they're just caused by limitation in the sensory information or limitation in the compute power or limitations in the information and prior beliefs, if you want, about the world, right? So that's kind of the general hypothesis. And um, based on that, we look into different things like low level perception, very basic things. We use very low level experiments simply to kind of test our approach, our modeling approach, or this general theory at the best possible level, the most quantitative level that we can, because we believe that when you do really trying to do that, then you can really nail down some of these constraints I was talking about. On the surface, a lot of things look like Bayesian. Oh yeah, look, they, they try to, you give them, you give human subjects some, some experimental task and you see, oh, they're slightly biased in one answer, favor of one answer to the other. 
And then it's easy to say, yeah, it's because there's some prior beliefs, right? That kind of pushes them to that answer versus the other. Yes, it might be, but that might not be the full story. Or, you know, it might not be at all because of that. And we have published work where we actually show, I don't know whether you're aware of that, but, you know, where people kind of behave like anti Bayesian in that sense, that they're biased away from the prior beliefs. So they make mistakes which actually are f- favoring solutions which are actually less probable, which had people. So it's like scratching they had a prior, so, but they go against their priors? Yes. But whereas they should go towards their prior. Yes. So naively, right, let's call it a Bayesian, the naive Bayesian view would be, oh, there's a prior. And, you know, if, if there's some uncertainty in their evidence, they should be biased towards a prior. Well, we show that, you know, people or people have observed that under certain situations, they go against that prior. So if they have uncertainty in the evidence, they actually seem to be biased away from that, from their prior beliefs. And nobody could explain that really satisfactorily. And we showed that you can still explain that in the Bayesian level. Okay. If you kind of step back and you, you kind of leave this naive thinking and you consider all the parameters of the Bayesian model. In particular, if the evidence representation is not homogeneous, for example, if we have cognitive resources that allow us to represent certain things uh, better than others, okay, more precise, that plays a role in the Bayesian in a in a Bayesian sense because then you know your likelihood is affected by the inhomogeneous evidence encoding, if you want, and that can lead to actually this counterintuitive situations where the bias is actually away from the prior. Even so, the system is doing a Bayesian inference computation. Okay, So things like that. And you can only dis- discover these things if you really try to go down the nitty gritty details and try to model this decision behavior at the, at the finest level. Do you have an example actually of, of that, like that what you just said? So the example that we also used uh, when we published that is that of perceiving visual orientation, right? We have, we have a sense of the world through our visual senses. We can judge whether some stimulus is, has a certain orientation, right? I show you, I show you a little line segment and you can pretty much tell me, oh yeah, it's vertical. It's a little to this side and that side. We can make that ta- task a little harder by adding some noise and showing it only briefly. So if you do that, you will observe that people, when they estimate, they tell you what the orientation is of such a little stimulus, they will be biased away from the cardinal orientation, which is, you know, vertical, horizontal. Okay. So I show you, I show you stimulus, which is kind of vertically aligned, but a little bit, let's say clockwise. People will perceive the orientation of that little clockwise oriented stimulus to be much more clockwise oriented. It actually is. So this seems like a bias, a bias away from the cardinals. So the same is true for horizontal orientation. The stimulus that's almost horizontal will be perceived less horizontal than it actually is. And depending on the uncertainty in the stimulus, uh, that bias will be even larger. So if it's more uncertainty, the evidence is even weaker. I present it even for a shorter period then this bias, this tendency to be pushed away from the cardinal orientation is even large. Mm-hmm. Okay, so naively one could say, well, yeah, it's probably because they have some prior belief that things are not cardinal, okay? That we have more, it's more likely that the orientation a priori, right, is oblique. That could be, but if you look into the statistics of our visual environment, so you take pictures from you know, from your everyday environment, your office, your backyard, the mountains, you go skiing, whatever. Okay. And you look, you analyze how many of the local little edges are oriented, you know, what's the distribution of these orient- orientations. You see that most, we have two peaks, one at the vertical cardinal orientation, one at the horizontal cardinal orientation. That means the prior has a peak at the cardinals and a trough in the oblique. And so if the system is trying to use these statistics in the environment to actually give you a good estimate on, on the presented orientation of the stimulus, 
they would have a prior exactly in the opposite direction. So they would, you know, naively would expect, oh, then we would report more cardinals, right, than uh, less. And so we can show, we, we were able to show that you can still explain that with the Bayesian framework with a prior at the cardinals. If you incorporate another very fundamental theory about neural encoding, which is called the efficient coding uh, theory. And uh, in short, efficient coding just explains that or assumes or postulates that the brain is basically allocating its encoding resources kind of efficiently, that it not just encodes everything the same precision, but it encodes things that are more important, more frequent with higher precision. So in addition to a prior at the cardinals, you would also expect that cardinal orientations are better represented be finer resolution. And that will affect then the inference, the Bayesian inference uh, prediction, because your know, finer resolution means you have a, a, a better, lower uncertainty, which means kind of a na- narrow, narrow likelihood. And that will ultimately, together with this Bayesian prior for cardinal orientations, will lead to this behavior that we actually see in humans. So I think that was a really convincing case for, you know, going one step further than the naive Bayesian approach uh, in, in modeling the mind, if you want. I don't know if I'm talking a little bit too specifically here, too technically. Just ask me questions if I think, you know, this is not something that uh, people will understand. I'm happy to try it. The, the audience is fairly technical, so don't worry about that. They love They love technical details, so... They are really cool, <laughs> but yeah, no, I love that. That's really fascinating. And we'll talk a bit more about that, uh, especially when we uh, talk about your study of humans, uh, visual speed perceptions, because I guess it will, it will also help us understand a bit more for now. Uh, a question I like to ask is, do you remember how you first got introduced to Bayesian methods? I saw your questions. I looked at them today and I really like that question. And I have a very unique, yes, I have, this is a, it's a particular day in my life. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 I can tell you. So this was at the conference. This conference was called NIPS, Neural Information Processing and Systems uh, back in the day. It still exists now. It's a huge conference, but it's all about machine learning these days. Back in the days, it was more broad, right? It was less big. And I was presenting there. I was in a workshop. And uh, I think it was 2002. And um, I was in a workshop. And at that time, I just finished my PhD. And I I built this, I told you before, I built this kind of integrated circuits that did some kind of neural computation. And I had a circuit that was computing basically visual motion and give you kind of an estimate of what we call optic flow, the, the motion information throughout the image. And it did that in a a pretty clever way. So it did this kind of a collective computation, you know, you compute motion locally, but then you have to constrain this information and combine it together to get some kind of a more global estimate because computationally the the problem is actually ill post locally. You have to actually do as a kind of collective computation. And when I was implementing this whole thing, uh, the algorithm into this neural circuit or this, this integrated semiconductor circuits, it turned out that I couldn't perfectly implement it, but rather there was some kind of intrinsic, call it a bias or a leak. I don't want to go too much into detail, which kind of constrained uh, the solution in a kind of fascinating way. It means when there was no visual input, it actually imposed a constraint on the solution. It kind of kept the circuit basically stable. And I formulated that back in the day as a kind of an optimization problem where you had You want to try to compute the optical flow as perfectly as possible, giving the visual input, but then you had some constraints on the the lateral connectivity and you had this kind of intrinsic constraint, the leak. And it was a kind of a Lagrangian optimization problem that the circuit was solving, finding the local minimum of energy dissipation. And I was in this workshop and there was a guy called Yoyo Weiss and he was working with my then future postdoc advisor, Eros Imageli. And he presented this Bayesian, this Bayesian, first Bayesian model about human motion perception that he and Eros actually, Simageli developed. 
And he showed these simulations of, or simulations, this is how this model would explain some kind of human psychophysical motion perception. So they had humans basically tested how humans perceive visual motion. They showed some kind of, we call it psychophysics, they showed some kind of curves, how humans do that. And he showed how his Bayesian model would do that. And I was sitting in there <laughs> looking at these curves and they look exactly how my chip had uh, was kind of you know computing motion how it would behave if you reduce the contrast of the stimulus the bias would go down and and so on and so forth and i realized there is an equivalent formulation for my lagrangian energy minimization procedure in this kind of new language it's called probabilistic inference in bayesian or bayesian in a bayesian formalism right it was a kind of a one to one map and that was the first time I actually he heard about Bayesian inference and got introduced to that. It was pretty impressive to me. I was really like, wow, you know, this is, first of all, I was super proud that my chip was doing all these things, <laughs> my system, but then really discovering that there's this kind of more, I wouldn't say more elegant or more general, yeah, different formulation of a problem instead of energies, he formulated in terms of probabilities. And that was a, uh, very impressive for me and probably influenced my choice of postdoc advisor too for sure and i see yeah that's so cool that you can like pinpoint to an exact date and time <laughs> that's quite rare oh the, yeah okay that's cool and already some perception work i can see that that's that's good and actually how i'm wondering how common bayesian stats are in your field because there are some fields where they are quite quite uncommon, but it seems to me like your field is way more using these kind of stats way more. Well, probably because the brain is like <laughs> quite Bayesian in some ways. So yeah, like how much of a black sheep are you in your field in a way? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not a black sheep in terms of my, my research. I don't think so. Uh, not at all. I think this idea that the human mind is an inference machine, this is much older than I am, of course. And so it was just natural that, that this cognitive scientist and then maybe also the perceptual scientist picked up on this notion that, oh, maybe the Bayesian formalism is actually a good model, okay, of what the brain is trying to do as a computational uh, goal, right? So it's basically describing in some ways the brain computation. I mean, there's something called the, the Bayesian brain hypothesis, which I, I fully support, right? It's basically saying that the, the brain is more or less a Bayesian inference machine. I mean, this is, of course, this is simplistic, but the basic components are there, right? It has to deal with imperfect information, not complete, right? Under, on, uh, how you say, incomplete. It has the notion of learning. We learn priors. We have previous experiences that we use, reuse, right? That's a, that's a big trait of, of the human mind. And we combine these things in a way that we kind of try to optimize our, our guesses, our, our output, right? To be as accurate as possible. And so I think as such, it, it's, it. Yeah. I like that also because it, it reminds me of what you said at the beginning, basically of like, yeah, like trying to optimize these outputs and. The biases that we can see are actually also a way to optimize the outputs, right? It's just, it's a different optimization function. The confirmation bias, for instance, is something that actually is super helpful in some ways, but then in some other situations, it's actually not what you would want to use. So you would want to be able to like consciously change the optimization function you're trying to, to optimize basically. And I guess that's one of the important things that your science is trying to do is like my PM mapping all of these and then afterwards trying to understand how okay now that we know how that works can we actually change these pathways and things like that and it's so challenging also based like i can see emerging research that basically shows that it's not because you know about a bias that you're going to automatically correct for it you have to really be extremely diligent in trying to correct for for instance your confirmation bias there's a fundamental problem here right as a bayesian if i have the right assumptions okay meaning the right prior then the bias uh, if my response is biased right that's actually 
the result of being as good as possible. Meaning, you know, these biases are, yes, they are an error. I, I make an error, but I cannot do better. Okay. This is basically the best possible behavior. And so biases in that sense are not really a, a bad thing. In an absolute sense, yes, they're bad, but you know, they are just reflecting this trade off that the system has to do by not having enough evidence or not certain evidence, right? And trade that off with prior assumptions, which are well founded on, on my prior experiences, right? And so this notion that you want to correct biases is in someone from a Bayesian perspective is actually not the thing you want to do. Okay. That doesn't make sense because the, bi the bias behavior in the Bayesian sense represents the best possible thing you can do. What you could do, okay, if that is not the desired output, if the feedback says, oh, no, you could adapt. Either your beliefs are wrong or not specific enough, right? It could be generally that's true, but you should have realized that we're not in a general setting. We are more in a specific setting and you should have used a more different specific prior there. And uh, that is true, but that immediately <laughs> imposes the question, well, another decision question, which is how can I decide that I'm not in this context, but in that context, and therefore I have to use that prior and not that one. It's another inference problem. And so we have these hierarchical inference problems, which makes actually cognitive science at this point, but it's one of the, the big questions, right? How, how are these hierarchies interacting? And, and so, uh, yeah. It's not trivial, okay? But this notion that the bias is actually a good thing is, is something that is really kind of difficult to wrap the, your head around. And I remember when I first presented some work about this motion biases and motion priors, some old uh, perceptual scientists came to me after my presentation and said, look, I don't understand why this can be, can we say this is optimal? This doesn't make sense, okay? If I don't, if I have a bias in estimate, for example, the speed of a wild animal running towards me, right? And that wild animal is a lion. If I underestimate the speed, then that's really bad for me. I'm going to be, you know, eaten by the lion. And the notion there is really, you know, yes, in that particular example, it's a bad thing. But in average, right, statistically seen, your percept is kind of the optimal percept, right? If I had no known that, you know, I'm in an environment where there are a lot of lions, right? Then I probably would have corrected my inference, probably not in terms of the statistics, but probably in terms of the value function. Okay. I would be super cautious. <laughs> I would have, you know, my loss function would be such that if I make a mistake in underestimating the speed of a lion approaching me, right, that would be a huge penalty. So I would shy away from that and that would, of course, introduce other biases in the opposite direction. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, so yeah, that's definitely context dependent for sure. Like that's, and like you can also think about it for confirmation bias, for instance, right? In this case, it's like actually way more like it's super useful if you're for sure in the forest or in the savanna and like you're like, you think you've heard a lion. So it's way better, like it's way better to optimize the function that says, well, be super cautious and look for a lion. So try to confirm what you already think, you know, whereas if you are doing science or trying to understand who to vote for in the next election, well, in that case, the confirmation bias is really bad because that's not what you should optimize for in this context, but the confirmation bias is actually something that will so save you in the wild. It will not save you when it comes to science or politics on the contrary, but no, it's not that that way of thinking is bad in itself. Absolutely. It's just like switching the way your thinking should be context dependent. Right. But that switching is another inference problem, right? So you uh, yeah. have a chicken and egg problem, right? So, so you know, exactly. it, it just goes up with the hierarchy, but exactly because you have to be like, in a way you have to be able to take enough perspective to understand that you have to change the way you're thinking and who is doing that, the already the, right. the person exactly. who was thinking in the first place is like, how do you do that? Right. But actually you've, yeah. so it's a perfect segue because you've mentioned, you just mentioned your study of a uh, human's visual speed perceptions. So that's actually something I really wanted to 
to talk with you about. So uh, can you work walk us through that basically? Yeah. So I, this, this, of course, is emerged from what I said before when I had this epiphany in this first encounter with the Bayesian framework, let's call it that way, right? I had been working on artificial neural network instantiated in, in kind of physical hardware that we're doing speed or motion perception, right? And so I already worked on the problem, the perceptual problem. And so when I then started my postdoc, and also given that my postdoc advisor worked on, on that problem as well, it was kind of natural and uh, uh, to continue that work. So the goal there was really, can we, can we de decide or can we figure out what kind of, let's assume humans are Asian, when they perceive something moving, can we decide what, or can we figure out what kind of priors they actually use by run, running some appropriate experiments and then doing some kind of modeling and trying to fit the model and then extract its priors? So that was the goal. And uh, yeah, because at, up to that point, I think nobody really, this Bayesian idea for perception and cognition was, was around, but nobody has really taken a model and formulated in a way that you could actually directly predict or model human behavior in a, uh, an experimental setting that we typically have. Uh, you, you put people in a, in a room with a screen, they look at some moving stimuli, and then they had to make some decision. Is that moving faster than that one? Right at that level, on this decision level, nobody really formulated Bayesian or has incorporated these Bayesian models. And therefore, nobody was really able to really directly fit, quantitatively fit, and figure out what these, these priors are that people use. And so I think my work was, you know, the, the first that did that. It took quite a while to actually figure out how to, to um, incorporate this, this Bayesian uh, model <laughs> in a larger model that you could then apply to human behavior. But uh, yeah, we finally did it. So what was the experiment? Shall I talk a little bit about the experiment? Or what's the most important, <laughs> interesting thing about it? This is a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, tell us about the experiment and then what, what you learned from the experiment. At that time, we knew that things that have low contrast, let's say a moving, a moving grading. So, you know what a grading is, just a black and white stripe pattern. Mm -hmm. And now imagine it's kind of, it's kind of drifting. Okay. It's, it's almost like, it's like a, a ball or a roll with some stripes on it and it's just rotating slowly and you just look at it top of it. You see this drifting gradings. If you reduce the contrast of that grading, make it very faint, black and white, and you ask people, how fast is that thing moving? The lower you make the contrast, the lower the perceived speed is of that people will report. So that has been known. And we had some hint that, yeah, if you reduce the contrast, you make the signal kind of very weak. Okay, the visual signal. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have a lot of uncertainty in it. And so the evidence, the visual evidence is low. The likelihood is broad, if you want, in a patient sense. And therefore, the prior will kind of play a larger role. And so we had this hunch that the prior should be probably a prior towards slow speed, meaning people assume that things generally don't move or move slowly, and only rarely they move very fast. Okay. And with such a prior and with this explanation that if you reduce the contrast, you basically make, introduce more uncertainty in the sensory signal that would qualitatively explain how the percept moved towards slower speed. Okay. So that was the starting point. So we say, okay, can we do an experiment where we systematically vary the contrast of these grading stimuli and their speed? And then collect a lot of data <laughs> with a large range. Okay. And then basically apply this Bayesian model and extract basically do reverse engineering of this prior from, from the data and the model. Trying to uncover people's priors, basically. Exactly. And so, yeah, so that's what we did. And so we had basically we did binary decisions on every trial. So we showed people two of these gradings with different speed and different contrast. And on each trial, they simply had to decide, they had to look in the middle, and then we presented these drifting gradings left and right of the fixation point for a brief period of time. And then they simply had to decide which one is moving faster, left or right, left, right, left, right. 
And they had to do about, I think, almost 6,000 trials of this, every single subject. And by manipulating the relative speed difference and the absolute speed and the relative contrast, we collected this decision data, okay, over this large range of, of contrast speed parameter. And from that, then we had a, a model where we say, okay, people generated a motion percept or, or a speed percept for each one of these two stimuli, according to a Bayesian model. And then they simply used make their decision with this one or that one based on the outcome of this Bayesian inference uh, processes. So if this one, after the Bayesian processing, comes out to be moving faster, inference says this is faster or this has a certain speed and this has a certain speed. If that one is higher than that one, people will make the decision accordingly. So that was the model. And then we assume there's a one prior about speed, which is the same across all conditions. And with that assumption, then we could go backwards. We had, uh, you know, a smaller number of parameters. So, so we could actually really fit this model to the data and extract this prior. And lo and behold, we found that, you know, this prior consistently across all subjects was a prior for slow speeds. So people assumed slow speeds are more frequent than higher speeds. And that was the, the end of the story at that point. People liked the story because it was the first time that somebody really tried to extract quantitatively right, what these priors are. And so that was, uh, it was also kind of a, a good, a good uh, study to actually initiate a lot of subsequent modeling attempts where people then try to do that for other tasks, other perceptual modalities and so on and so forth. So basically, does that, does that mean that for uh, like most of the time, we see, oh no, basically, if I understand correctly, that means that, for instance, when we have less contrast, so for instance, at night, we will estimate that things are moving, are moving slower than during the day, for instance. Yes. That's also why it's hard, like it makes it even more dangerous to drive at night, for instance, or cross the street at night. A couple of issues there, <laughs> but one is certainly that one, okay? Other issues are that you know, the visual system is in a different state. Different photoreceptors are active when it's dark and, and they're, they're slower and so on and so forth. But certainly what people have shown, it's actually pretty interesting that when people drive in cars, when the conditions are such that there's a lot of fog, so foggy conditions, okay? You can't see really much. It's not dark, it's enough light, right? So the photo visual system is in a, in a high light condition. But the visibility is very low, and if you see something, it's very, it's very fuzzy. People seem to drive faster under these conditions than if, if it wasn't foggy. And that makes total, total sense, right? Because they perceive their own speed as being lower, right? Slower, yeah, of course. And so they yeah. accelerate, unless they look on the, on the, on the tachometer and then say, oh shit, I'm driving too fast, right? But apparently, they have people have measured that, and it seems to be a real effect. Yeah, that's so fascinating. <laughs> that, that reminds me of George Carling's famous line: "You know, like, did you notice that anybody driving slower than you is a moron, and anybody driving faster than you is a maniac?" <laughs> <laughs> they might have the wrong prior, or you know, I don't know. They have yeah. maybe <laughs> maybe they should wash their their windshields, right? <laughs> But yeah, that makes total sense because yeah, I was actually going to ask you something related to that is that, okay, so, but that's for, because I was thinking when I'm, for instance, a pedestrian crossing the street, then I would at night estimate that a car coming is actually coming slower than I would see the same car at, uh, during the day. But then I was thinking, and how does that change when I'm moving myself? For instance, like if, if I'm in a car, there is a car coming my way. Does that like the prior stays the same or do we have different priors when we are actually moving also? That's a good question. So that's our study couldn't address that, right? We, we had basically people being stationary and looking at just drifting patterns. These were not even object moving, right? These were, as I told you, like this rotating rolls. You can imagine like that looking at them. So the question whether people have these kind of priors when they move themselves, whether that changes anything, that's a, it's a really good one. Uh, but we haven't really tested that. It's, it's a little hard to test. Yeah. 
you can guess that. <laughs> <laughs> then there's also the question when we tested this, these stimuli weren't really associated with a particular object. It was really kind of this drifting gradings. And so is it the question then, are these priors that we have, do we, are they generalizable to moving objects where you could imagine that moving objects, every object might have a different, comes with a different behavioral characteristic, right? And so if I see a lion, <laughs> right, I know the lion has probably a different motion distribution than, you know, a turtle. And so if I know that and I recognize this as a lion, it would be clever to use, you know, the specific prior for that specific object, right? Rather than some generic overall statistical prior. We haven't been going that direction at all, even so it's a really interesting one. So the studies I did would not be able to kind of disambiguate these things. Well, if anybody want to wanna do a PhD in neuroscience, yeah. they already have a topic. It's good. Come join our program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you heard it, folks. <laughs> yeah. That sounds fascinating. Honestly, I'm like, I have so many questions and I'm already kind of impressed by just like, you know, the plasticity of the brain, because I'm guessing these priors are quite old in our history, but still we're able to update them. I don't know if we update. Yeah, I guess we updated them because uh, like, if you think about it, the advent of really fast motions is really, really recent, right? We have cars almost everybody for like, I don't know, 50 years tops. And like, we're still able to like, basically we can cross the street pretty safely. We take trains, we, we take planes. And, and this basically is pretty fascinating to me how basically the brain can adapt extremely quickly to these new conditions. And when you compare to the history of our evolution, so like it appeared, I don't know if our evolution was written down in one hour, like this, last thing the cars appeared in like the last millisecond right now, you know? So it's fascinating to me. It is. I would say in terms of the motion statistics, it might not be so much different or let's say it, it kind of changed kind of gradually maybe. So I think the system had enough time to slowly change to it. You know, even in, let's say 200 years ago, people were riding horses. Horses go pretty fast. Right? I mean, you know, True. you observe birds flying by, they will pretty fast too, or, you know, you, you play ball. I don't know how old football, soccer is, right? I'm just saying, probably even at that time, people were exposed to, yeah. to a broad spe a spectrum of, of, of motion and speeds and, and, you know, patterns. But yeah, I think I remember when there was this fear then when the, when the train was invented, right? The railway. There is always amazing fears where it's time and new technology <laughs> appears. So I love those yeah, stories. Yeah, right. like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a specific story, but I thought, you know, there was the concern that people would die if they go on a tra on a train and would experience speeds that are faster than, I don't know, 50 miles per hour or something like that. Um, probably some medical doctors had some concerns that the organism would just blow up. Didn't happen. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Now it's super easy to know, but I don't know what they knew at the time about human, the human body or stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that kind of concern definitely happens if you're talking about space travel. I right? know like you have to, like, when you have to do any huge acceleration, you know, like, we cannot take, I think, more than seven Gs or something like that, right? So, as I like, start taking more than seven Gs, basically, you're going to start to have a lot of troubles. Uh, especially if you're not trained. So, yeah, I mean, it actually could be a concern. I could see how they could think it would be a concern. Yeah. I'm guessing this is extremely hard to know that and maybe it's impossible, but uh, what are the, are there any theories about why we would develop such a prior? So like why in situation where contrast is lower, we would get that prior that things are moving slower. That's the beauty about this, this Bayesian explanation is, right? The prior is the same. The prior is a stationary fixed prior that's just reflecting, let's say, the statistics of how things move in our environment. Or more precisely, how the visual information on our retina, what's the dynamics of that, right? Because that's kind of the input uh, that we provided in these experiments. It's fixed. So it doesn't matter if the contrast is low or high, right? It's fixed because that's, that's basically 
the statistical ground truth. And the effect that low contrast stimuli are perceived to move slower is not because the prior changes. It's because that the evidence, the sensory evidence, the eye telling us, oh, something is actually moving, right? That evidence gets weaker and weaker because the signal is, is lower. And if you have some noise later on in the brain, right, that will lead to just less, less evidence, less strong evidence. And what you do in a patient's sense, if your evidence is weak and tells you, yeah, something might move with about that speed, but you know, I don't know, it could be faster or it could be slower. You call upon the prior, right? You multiply your prior with your evidence. And if the evidence is weak, right, the prior is going to dominate in your posterior probability. Okay. In the worst case, or the worst case, the extreme case, you don't see anything moving, right? It's black or it's uniform. Uh, well, it could be that something is moving. You just can't see it. But your default assumption is, well, no, nothing moves, right? And that's totally explainable by having a prior for slow speeds, right? If the likelihood is basically uniform, it could be any motion, but I can't see it. Then your prior says, no, okay, I have a peak or, you know, my center of mass or whatever you want to use there is at zero. And therefore I would predict, you know, most likely nothing moves. That's the idea. And, and it's, it's nice how this framework with this fixed prior, right, can explain all these effects when you start playing with the strength of the evidence and so on and so forth. Yeah, super fascinating. And like, that makes me think, have you done some work? And then this is something we talked about with Pascal Wallis a bit also is, have you done some work then in how we could change people's priors? That's a good idea or a good idea, a good question. Sorry. It might be a wrong idea in a lot of circumstances. It's a question of... <clears throat> What time scale do you think these priors are established? I think you said before, right? There's some very old priors, basically giving the notion that these might even priors that you're kind of born with, maybe. Or certainly, you know, over the development, you kind of learn the statistics of your environment, right? The speed prior or the other prior we talked about, right? The orientation about little visual line segments, the orientation in your environment that we have more cardinal and uh, orientations and oblique. This is something that you might learn over a long time period. And so it's going to be probably really hard to kind of change those because they're probably well ingrained in the system. But then on the other hand, you know, we are talking about low level perceptual priors. Of course, there are higher level, more cognitive priors, priors about, I don't know, I don't have a good example. Um, you talked about politics, prior about you know, how certain parties will behave, right? You have a certain prior about how they, what kind of program they will have and stuff like that. That's probably also pretty rigid. <laughs> it's probably not a good example. I don't know, the stock market, maybe. <laughs> there are certain, you know, classes of companies which, you know, could be good investment. So maybe you have a prior skewed towards certain technology companies that can change quickly, right? If the technology falls apart or something new comes. So how can you change these priors? Yeah, well, I think the easiest way to think about it is simply by you know, experience and get feedback. So if I, I have the right prior and I use it in a Bayesian way, then my decision-making will be as good as possible and my feedback will be, you know, good. I will make mistakes, but everybody's going to make mistakes. And if I'm the one with the perfect prior, the best prior, <laughs> then, you know, on average, I will do the, the fewest mistakes compared to all the others. And you will realize that if you get feedback and you compare, right? And so you get a constant notion of how well calibrated your belief system is given, given the environment. And so if you want to change that for whatever reason, you have to start changing the statistics of the environment, statistics of the decision tasks, right? Before it was good to assume these beliefs, now in this new environment, well, that will give you a disadvantage. If you learn, then you will adapt. You'll pick up on those new priors and, and incorporate them. That's how I understand learning. Give feedback. So if you, if you want people to learn the right thing, give True, full feedback. If you want people to learn the wrong prior beliefs, give feedback, but lie to them, okay? Give them wrong feedback. That's something that people 
trying to do all the time, right? They wanna... Yeah, and that's why I mean that's why the information like the topics of information bubbles and and things like that are even more worrying, worrisome because like you, that's exactly the kind of of situations where then people are less and less exposed to ideas they don't agree with, and so also they get less and less feedback and they get also less and less able to accept feedback because it's so rare to get ideas that are outside of what you think that then it becomes kind of like an aggression. You don't like it. And so you don't want it anymore. And so you don't get the feedback in the end, which sure. makes everything harder. So you can really kind of extrapolate that to kind of a social context, right? And, and particularly nowadays with all the social media, with all these kind of manipulations of social or, or mainstream opinions, right? I think what would protect people to some degree from, from this kind of manipulation attempts, let's call it, if they can get their own feedback, okay? That would be helpful, right? If you sit in front of your TV and your computer and the only feedback you get and the only information you get is the same channel, right? You have no way to calibrate what you have been told with reality. You can, yeah. you can know way that your belief system is actually correct. But if you listen to, you can still listen to the whatever mainstream media or whatever information you get or you, you receive. If you then go and, you know, go, go outside, go interact with people, talk to these people that you have heard are bad people or good people, talk to them directly yourself. You get direct feedback yourself, which will definitely be a source that you probably also trust much more. And that will recalibrate your belief system. Okay. So, yeah, if you want a lesson for modern society, I think it's really just one thing you said, right? You should not shut down about information that is kind of against your belief system, right? Because then you will never, <laughs> you will shrink your bubble even more. And, and the second one is to, to get real feedback. And you can only get that by doing it yourself or going out and get that experience firsthand, okay? Or as direct as possible. That's what I... And it's definitely a skill to... It's definitely a skill to develop and it's extremely useful, but it's something that requires dedication and practice. So it's hard. <laughs> so it's not something we usually like to do. So it's yeah. hard because you have to actually do something <laughs> actively. Yeah. That's also uh, w one aspect, right? Uh, you yeah. have to get up. Okay. Be active. I mean, that's what I try to teach my kids, right? Listen to what people say, but then always trying to get your own experience as a kind of a, a calibration way to do it, right? Get your own feedback, try it out see what's happening. Yeah, that's actually super fascinating. And actually, you're, like you inspired me another question, which would be like, yeah, something I would be super curious is like, do we come to the world as, you know, when we are born, do we come to the world without priors or like with flat priors and then develop those priors or are the priors already something we have like that are coded already in the brain? Like that would, that sounds fascinating to me. Are we born frequentists and then become Bayesians? Are we already Bayesians when we just are born into the world? Fascinating question. Here is another PhD thesis to make. That's hard to work on, right? Because you cannot really experimentally test that, I guess, or you can work. I mean, people work with children and, and you see how they learn and you can do some, can deduct something there, but it's a good question. I, you know, Ultimately, I don't think it's, it's so important because, I mean, clearly we cannot have priors at more abstract, higher level uh, things, right? Babies don't know anything about, you know, social structures. They don't know anything about politics or, or anything like that, right? I, I assume. But on the lowest level, right, these, these priors that we talked about, the speed and, and, and orientation and things like that, it's hard to say because as soon as they see, right, things, they got a lot of data already, visual data. As soon as they open their eyes, as soon as their optics is get, getting to a level that they actually they can actually see something, they immediately get blasted with a lot of statistical uh, data. And uh, so I think it's not difficult to believe that building up the priors at that point 
they would pretty quickly get some decent uh, representation of those priors, right? So I don't think there's any need for having these kind of priors being built in. Uh, maybe there are some really fundamental priors, more about, I don't know, people would call that probably more behavioral aspects, Yeah, like how do you... Aspects, like, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like the interaction to survive mm-hmm. yeah, with the mother, right? A, a newborn. Yeah, exactly. Right? How do you know it's your mother, basically? Like, that must be something you... It's quite intuitive. Yeah. And also, like, is that... I know that's pop, wrong pop science, but I seem to remember that, <laughs> you know, like, there are some studies that shows that show that we already hear stuff even before being born. I don't know how true that is. I've never looked at those studies. So like, if that's true, then maybe probably we already have some priors because you already hear and have feedback from the outside world. Sure. I don't know um, how true yeah, that is. Yeah, I don't know either. Right? <laughs> Putting headphones on your pregnant wife or girlfriend's belly, right? And playing Mozart and stuff like that. Uh, we should not forget priors is probably not just, a, it's not a synonym for for just knowledge, right? Some kind of re- reflective or reflexive behavior, like a newborn knows how to drink, right? It knows that, that you know, action, that behavior. That's not a prior, right? That's really kind of a very concrete action that it just knows. My priors are really kind of statistical knowledge. What's the distribution of things? Um, yeah, let's say no. Let's say no. It's, it's unless somebody can... Can convincingly, all right, let's be parsimonious, right? That's what we scientists like to do. Unless you don't need that extra button, right? Or, or explanation. Let's, let's, let's keep it at that until somebody really can show that, oh no, actually people have priors and they are born. So I'm going to have to let you go in a few minutes because you've already been extremely generous with your time. But uh, before the last two questions, I'd like to ask you more globally. What would you say is your, your field's biggest question right now? Or more specifically, like the one question that you'd like the answer to before you die? <laughs> oh, yeah. When do you want to stop? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's say I'm a cognitive scientist. Okay. I'm happy with that, with that, with that terminology. Right now, there's an obvious thing, right? That's happening right now and really right now, which is the advent of these seemingly intelligent AI machines, right? Chat GPT as a kind of a keyword here, right? This has shaken the cognitive science community pretty badly. Mm-hmm. Well, it has shaken it, whether badly or not. But it's funny because you get this, you see that essentially two camps of researchers in the way they, they react to the advent of this really sophisticated, let's call it sophisticated artificial intelligence algorithms and, and learning machines, right? And there's this one camp that says, oh, yeah, they're pointing out all all the flaws, right? Oh, you look, yesterday I asked ChatGPT the following question, look how dumb it is and what kind of uh, yeah, irrational response it gives and look how it kind of pretends and tries to justify its mistakes. There are quite a few groups of those, quite a few people of those. They say, oh, human, they think, and these machines don't think, and it's about understanding, and they don't understand. This is kind of a, it's mostly these people that are, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to be harsh here, but (laughs) they're more coming from the kind of the, the philosophical side into cognitive science, okay? They feel kind of threatened, and I think... They should, to some degrees. <laughs> and so they're trying to kind of separate and, and basically point out the differences, right, between the human mind and, and, and how this AI machine works. And then there's the other group that says, oh, look, how cool. Look, what we already can do, right? Whether you call that intelligence or understanding or not, uh, it doesn't matter. But look, look how far we can go by using a bottom-up approach where it's all about learning it's some basic, essentially some basic neuroscience knowledge of how the minds, the human mind, the brains, right, are built. They have individual neurons. They connect with some weights, right? That's basically the machinery, right? And then we have this massive amount of data. Now I'm simplifying. Any, any AI researcher out there, don't, don't get mad, right? I'm just purposely <laughs> simplify this, but you know, it's still essentially true. You know, it's the perceptron uh, or Macaulay's and Pitt's a neural network uh, style, which is almost a hundred year old. That's the machinery, right? 
and he can do already these really incredible things. Okay. So I think this is cool because it tells us maybe there's not so much more we need to basically be able to build machines that will ultimately behave like the human mind. And um, I think this is super fascinating in the sense that, well, we're close. <laughs> and uh, I'm coming from the engineering world. I have worked with this really old two-layer neural network back in the 90s. They already could do stuff. Um, I'm not threatened. I, I think it's exciting. And um, what I would like to see is that the things that I have learned from using Bayesian modeling, <laughs> which is what I would call a kind of a more kind of a, a higher level top down description of cognitive mechanisms, rather than just pushing everything into kind of the learning and the humongous architecture, neural network architecture, and a lot of learning, right? Bottom up, that we can use some of these ideas to really build it into such learning machines with all their might and power, right, uh, in terms of their dimension and the data they can learn, and then actually do the last step, okay, to get machines that are, we can have an interaction and, and a, a podcast like you and I, okay? That I, I don't think we're so, so far away. And, and, and really, personally, that's also my next step I want to do. I've been now working on these Bayesian models and top-down models, if you want, these high-level models. And you just see how you reach the limits of these models, right? Because you cannot really apply it to real, real everyday questions and, and situations. We're always constrained to kind of simplified scenarios simply because of the dimensionality. We need learning. We need to incorporate these learning algorithms. And if you can merge this, this is going to be very successful and, and getting us to this, this last couple percents that we need. I will remember from your answer, though, that you want, you want to put me out of my own podcast and replace me with a machine. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> no, but you implied it. That's even worse. <laughs> I think it's time to call it a show. <laughs> but before, let me ask you the two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. So if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? By probably mean kind of totally unspecific, uh, anything that I could consider a problem. Can be anything you want can be mechanical engineering for Formula One, if you want. You know, I haven't thought about this. This is, this is a hard question. <laughs> I could say anything like, oh, I want it, something about humanity. And I think that's boring. That's kind of a given. Yes, I want humans to be peaceful with each other and the human humanity to be, you know, responsible for their planet that they live on and so on and so forth. But, oh, gee. okay, I, here's one. <laughs> It's a personal thing. I would really love to make it able that we can do, we can travel with light speed. Okay. I want to, I would like to explore, you know, uh, different galaxies or whatever, different planets out there and, and see. That's just really a personal, a personal wish because I always wanted to be an explorer and, and on this planet and even now on, on the, the mind, it doesn't feel so kind of this map with all the white spots. It doesn't feel like that anymore. So I'd, I'd love to be one of these explorers like Columbus or whatever, one of these old guys that explored new worlds. I, I'd love that. Nice. Yeah, this is such a cool answer. You see, well done for sticking with it. I think you're the first one to answer that. I love it. I would I would definitely be down for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also fascinated by that, like exploring, exploring the universe. That's I'm down for it. No, that sounds amazing. If I have unlimited resources, I can make a two-seater. So you can join me. We can go yeah. fly, you know. Oh, okay, perfect. Good. Let's do that. Thanks a lot. But yeah, yeah, I love that. That's definitely super interesting. And actually, if you like, that's, I'm, I'm pretty sure one of the previous guests that I had here. So Daniel Whiteson, he was here for episode 72 and he wrote two books and like the first one, I really love the second one too, but the, the first one is called, we have no idea, a guide to the unknown universe. And so he's a physicist and I think he didn't even answer that, even though <laughs> I'm pretty sure he would be, he would like to 
to explore too. So okay. I'm pretty well, sure Daniel. We add another, we add another yeah. seat. <laughs> if, if Daniel is listening, I think he's pretty proud of your answer. So yeah, I'll, I'll put that episode by the way in the show notes because I really loved it. So it's why the universe is so deliciously crazy with Daniel White. And it will be in the show notes, folks. And okay. I'm working on a very cool physics oriented episode that I should record this summer. I'm not going to tell you more. That because maybe it will not happen, but if it happens, that's going to be super cool. And I'll post some picture in the, in the Slack channel for the, the patrons. That's all. I'm not going to say more. So <laughs> last question for you, Alan, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive or fictional, who would it be? Why are you bringing the hard questions all the way in the end? Because you have more time to think about it. <laughs> Can I pick two? Sure. My first pick is probably, since, you know, this is, of course, a little biased from my heritage, but it's probably going to be Goethe, Goethe, German, you know, universal scientist, genius, right? Mm -hmm. I read a lot of his poems and writings in, in school. We had to read that. But then he was also a scientist. He was a color scientist. And he just sounded like a genuinely interesting guy. I'd love to hang out with him and have, you know, dinner and whatever follows dinner. And then the other person is just because I read some of his books recently. It's uh, Richard Feynman. And um, some of my colleagues will kind of really, you know, don't like that answer because they think he's a chauvinist and whatever. He might have been, you know, I'm not defending his lifestyle or whatever. doesn't matter. But as a scientist and just reading his books and, and his, his mind and his openness and his curiosity, I think, and just his willingness to do, just focus on the things and the question and nothing else matters, right? No social uh, context, really. He comes across like that. So I would have loved to see him in person just to see whether my beliefs built on this information uh, given by his books is actually met. So yeah, two choices. I mean, there are hundreds of others, but here you got it too. Oh, for sure. I love that. Um, <laughs> and you, we have quite a, quite some people already among the, the 80 plus guests who have answered Richard Feynman. So it would be really? a good company. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Didn't know. Which book have you read from him lately? Yeah. Well, uh, his book about computation, how is it called? I don't even know exactly the title, uh, which is really, it, this is a kind of a, a factual book, right? So he's, he's writing about his views and it's, it's very technical. And then, of course, his, his anecdotes, uh, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, which is probably more reason why I, I mentioned him because of his life and, you know, his episodes. So. Yeah, these days, you know, academia seems a little duller. But that's always uh, the notion, right? You look always back and say, ah, the old days were so much better. He probably would not be able to hold on, on a pos to a position in academia anymore these days. It's my guess. With the things he's done and stuff like that. So that's why I'm saying it's a little duller these days. Thank you very much. Ari, Thank you. loved Talking with you, I learned a lot. I hope listeners too. I really love that series of episodes about neuroscience and how the brain works. So probably there will be more. If listeners have recommendations about guests and topics that they would like to hear, please get in touch. You know where we are, right? LinkedIn, Twitter. And if you're a patron, of course, you have the Slack channel. So just hit me up here. And on that note, well, as usual, I put resources and a link to her website, Alan, in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again for taking the time and being on this show. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. 
you can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesy and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation.